السلام عليكم ورحمة الله تعالى وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على سيدنا ونبينا وحبيبنا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه وأتباعه إلى يوم الدين اللهم فقهنا في الدين وعلمنا التأويل وألهمنا بفيض فضلك رشدنا Ya Rabbil Alameen. Alhamdulillah, given the present crisis in Gaza and Palestine and the, the devastating destruction and particularly the loss of life there, but also the heartening response of the believers around the world to this crisis, we wanted to look at the faith dimensions, the religious dimensions of this matter, and to try to understand what is the significance of the land of Palestine? What is the significance of Jerusalem, Al-Quds, of Masjid Al-Aqsa, and these lands around it? What is the significance of Gaza and Asqalan in Islamic history? And then from that to understand how we got here and most importantly at the end, what are we to do in response beyond the obvious, beyond the obvious. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to facilitate that for us and to grant us the faith and certitude to, to proceed in the ways pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the first thing we're going to do is to look briefly at the sacred history of Palestine, Jerusalem, Masjid al-Aqsa, and Gaza. So that's the first thing. And for that, I wanted to begin by asking a question. That what is the Islamic significance of Palestine? What is the Islamic significance of Palestine? Anyone? Why is it Islamically significant? Yeah, so one of the answers is that it is the first direction of prayer, the Qibla. Of course, the question would be, why was it the first direction of prayer? Because revelation began in Mecca. And the Kaaba is right there. So why not just pray towards the Kaaba? And those of you who are online are also welcome to post about this bi'ithnillahi ta'ala. What is the, so the question is, what is the Islamic significance of Palestine? It's the land of the prophets. But, and that's true as well. Why is it the land of the prophets? So, and these are questions we should always ask ourselves, right? As believers, you know, we are followers of our beloved Prophet Muhammad وسلم, who said, Inna I was only sent as a teacher. And part of teaching or learning is to always ask questions. The Prophet ﷺ said, Dunya mal'una, mal'unun ma fiha. Worldliness is distant from divine mercy. And all that is in it distances from divine mercy. Illa dhikrullahi wa ma wala, except for the remembrance of God. And what relates to it, wa illa aliman aw mutallima, and except for the teacher of sacred knowledge or the seeker of sacred knowledge. And as, uh, the, muta the person of knowledge is the one who acquires knowledge by inquiry, by inquiry. They ask questions. This is one of the, like, one takes knowledge, but then one engages with knowledge by asking questions. 
And the ulama tell us, like educators of past traditions, that there are four fundamental questions. Mada, what? Limada, why? Kaifa, how? And meta, when? These are the four fundamental questions. What, why, how, and when? And we should always ask those questions because our beloved Prophet ﷺ also tells us that من يريد الله به خيرا يفقهه في الدين Whomever Allah wishes well for, He grants depth of understanding in religion. And depth of understanding, fiqh, is to go beyond the superficial to the realities of things, to appreciating the context purpose, and consequences of things. Fiqh is akin to wisdom. It's to know the realities, the context, reality, and consequences of things. And that's how we should be as believers. So the significance of Palestine can be summarized that there's a connection to divine oneness with these lands of Palestine, and in particular with the city of Jerusalem itself and Masjid Al-Aqsa. Why? We know that the purpose of existence itself, of creation, right, that the wisdom of it is that Allah chose without need that he create existence. He is beyond time and eternal and absolutely perfect. Were he not to have created anything, it would not affect his absolute perfection in any way whatsoever. We know that. But he chose that there be creation. And in his wisdom, in that creation, he placed jinn and human beings with the capacity of moral choice and granted them the capacity to recognize him accept him, submit to him, and act in accordance with his divine command. This purpose is closely related to Palestine and the lands of the Levant. Why? Be and in particular, Quds itself, right? which in the pre-Islamic tradition was also called Iliya. But the Muslims and this term in Arabic, Al-Quds, the sanctified city, the sacred city, the city of purity. Taqdis is to purify something and to remove harm and blemish from it. But why is it called Quds? Why is it called Quds? If we step back and look at the Islamic tradition, one of the greatest books of Islamic theology, of Islamic beliefs, by Imam Fakhreddin al-Razi is called Asasu taqdis the foundations of divine sanctity. The foundations of divine sanctity. Right? When we go into the bowing position, in prayer, what do we say? We make we say, we say Subhana Rabbi Al-Azim, Subhana Rabbi Al-Azim, Subhana Rabbi Al-Azim. Then one of the Sunnah dhikrs is to say Subuhun Quddusun Rabbul Malaikati wa Ruh. Subuhun, how exalted are you? Quddus, how sanctified are you? Meaning how pure, how utterly pure and beyond all blemish are you. Rabbul Malaikati wa Ruh, O Lord of the angels and the sacred spirit. So why did, why did they call it Al-Quds? It's not an accident. Because if we look at the prophetic tradition, Allah, 
well, if you look at the Quran first, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Quran, Allah Most High tells us in the Quran that truly the first house that has been established for humanity is that in Mecca, tremendous in blessings and a guidance to all people and generations of the world. In it abound magnificent clear signs of its greatness, the place where Abraham stood and whoever enters it is safe. This is from Surat Ali Imran, the third surah of the Quran, verses 96 and 97. So the very first house established on earth by the first of, of humanity, by Sayyidina Adam alayhi salam. He, after this coming down on earth, he was commanded by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to establish a place of worship. What place was that? As we know from the Quran, it was Mecca. And its ancient name was Bekka. Was Bekka. And that was the first place where Allah was worshipped on earth. And the ulama actually tell us that even before Sayyidina Adam, the angels had established worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in that sacred piece of land that is Mecca. And what's the wisdom of it being the first place of worship on earth? A trem tremendous in blessings and guidance for all people and generations of the world. In it abound magnificent signs of its greatness. And what are signs? Ayat. A sign is that which points to that which is signified. But what is a sign ultimately pointing to? What does a sign point to? A sign points to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells in the Quran that certain things are signs, the point of the sign isn't, oh wow, it's special, but that there is a relationship between that thing, that sign, that matter of significance, and upon reflection, we understand how it points towards Allah and His oneness and our duty in our reality as servants of God, as seekers of truth, as morally responsible beings. So there's a significance there. What is a the significance? Right? There are signs in it of the greatness of Allah. And that's why Sayyidina Ibrahim stood there right, in Mecca. And that is where one finds safety. Of course, there's the war practical safety that no fighting nor killing should take place in Mecca. But one finds spiritual sanctity and safety there. So that's about Mecca. The Sahaba wondered, so they asked. Right? And there's a beautiful hadith in Sahih Muslim. An Abi Dharrin radiallahu ta'ala anhu anhu qal, sa'altu Rasulullahi sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam, an awwali masjin wudi'a fil ard. So Abu Dharr radiallahu ta'ala anhu asked the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, what was the first mosque on earth? So the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, in this rigorously authentic hadith, it's in Sahih Muslim, he said sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, qala al-masjid al-haram, it was the sacred mosque, meaning the, the, the Haram al-Sharif of Mecca, where the Kaaba is. Abu Dhar was a seeker of knowledge. Right? And this is very important for us as believers. We don't just find sufficiency in a little bit. Right? We seek to understand things with depth, with context, with consequence to have deep understanding. 
people who watch sports. Right? They read, they listen to pregame analysis, post-match analysis. What do they do during the halftime break? They watch the high halftime show. Why? Because they want to understand something that a few days later has no consequence. Right? But these things have eternal consequence. So we should have at least as much as concern for deen as others or perhaps ourselves have for dunya. So Sayyidina Abu Dhar asked the question, Qultu, thumma ay, then which mosque? So the, mes the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, al-masjid al-aqsa. Then he said, then it is masjid al-aqsa. Okay. And the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was then asked, Qult, kam kana baynahuma? So Sayyidina Abu Dhar didn't just ask, then which mosque was it? So the first mosque was Masjid al-Haram. Second mosque was Masjid al-Aqsa. But notice here, Sayyidina Abu Dhar as a seeker of knowledge. The second mosque, okay, fine. How much time passed between the two? The Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Arba'una ama, 40 years. Right? And in the context of human history, 40 years is not much. 40 years is not much. The so first place Sayyidina Adam came down, that was established was Masjid al-Haram. Right? Now it wasn't in this form, right? but the Kaaba was, or, the original foundation of the Kaaba was established by, by in terms of amongst human beings by Sayyidina Adam. There are narrations that the angels had established that before. But the angels are not in our physical realm. What they establish, we do not see. So it was after it by 40 years. But then the Prophet ﷺ added a beautiful point. He said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Thumma al Ardu Laka Masjid. And then the Prophet Sallallahu said, and then the earth, all of it is a masjid for you. فَحَيْثُ أَدْرَكَكَ الصَّلَاةَ فَصَلِّ So whenever, wherever you find yourself at the time of prayer, pray. And this is a tremendous gift to the believers. We can perform our complete prayer with all the aspects of the prayer, wherever we may be. And of course, our intention should be that we pray in the masjid. For men, that we pray in congregation. But if you find yourself elsewhere, we do all the things and we have the full reward. And this is of the many honors. The whole earth is with the obvious exceptions. You, 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 you avoid praying in the toilet or etc. But even if you're, what do you do if you're locked in the toilet? You can even pray there. Just don't pray on the filth itself. Of course, a washroom is not a toilet. So it's famous that Sayyidina Sulaiman salam is the first person to have established the, the mosque, the place of prayer in Jerusalem. Imam Al-Qurtubi addressed this in his explanation of, explanation of the verses from Surah Ali Imran. And he explained that there are phases in the establishment of Masjid Al-Aqsa, just like the Masjid al-Haram, that, mes that, that place of prayer in al-Aqsa, okay, in Quds, okay, it was first established as a place for the glorification of Allah on earth by the angels. And this come in tradition from Sayyidina Ali bin Abi Talib about that. Then there are narrations that Imam al-Qurtubi and many other Imams say that then Sayyidina, then who established it as an actual physical place of worship? Sayyidina Adam alayhi salam. As a place of worship. As a place of worship of, for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this land was a land for tawheed, for divine oneness from time immemorial. 
from time immemorial. But there's also a divine wisdom, which is that Mecca is in the midst of the desert. It is much, it's very hard to get to from the outside. The population of the core of the Arabian Peninsula was and remains relatively low. It was never densely populated. If you consider how large modern day Saudi is and how much its own population is, if you take out all the migrant peoples, it's remarkably small for such a large land because most of it is desert. But the second house for the worship of Allah in Quds, that region is referred to in European languages as the first, the fertile crescent. The lands of Sham are referred to as the fertile crescent. Because they're lands where there is water, there is agriculture. Allah has blessed it by the fig and the olive and much abundance. So, Palestine is a land of prophets and divine oneness. So many of the prophets that are mentioned in the Quran are, were centered around that land. And many people wonder that, is the Quran a Middle Eastern book? In the sense that, why are only the prophets of that region mentioned? Because that region has consequence when it comes to the end of time. That is the region where the Prophet ﷺ will appear. And he appeared. right? But then beyond that, it is a land of Tawheedic significance going forward. We know that there are prophets sent to other lands. But their mention has been lost. Their teachings corrupted beyond recognition. The ulama of many lands, of India, great scholars like Mirza Jana Jana and others wondered that were some of the figures of the Hindu tradition originally prophets. Also, we don't have any proof of that. And the general contour of their teachings has been distorted beyond Tawheedic recognition. It's also speculated by Al-Biruni and others who talk about Al-Hind. Likewise, many of the scholars speculated about Buddha and Confucius and others that were these, but we have no evidence. We, do, we are not saying that the great Hindu figures or Buddha or Confucius or so and so were prophets. We do not know. It's lost in the midst of time. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in his great divine wisdom focused on these lands. Because the Quran is not a book of history, though everything mentioned in it is truth. The stories of the Quran are not mere stories, but rather they are, they are history with guidance significance. It's history with guidance significance. So just to mention some of the prophets who are mentioned in the Quran, who are connected with the land of Palestine. Firstly, we have Sayyidina Ibrahim. Of course, this is excluding the fact that Sayyidina Adam, it's come that he's the first to establish that, but Sayyidina Adam and his connection with Palestine, with the lands of Sham, is not mentioned in the Quran. But Sayyidina Ibrahim, alayhi salam, was originally from Iraq, from the lands of Iraq. But then he migrated to the lands of Sham, the lands of the greater Levant, with his family. And with him were his nephew, Sayyidina Harun alayhi salam, and Sayyidina Lut alayhi salam. And they lived and died in the lands of Palestine. Sayyidina Ibrahim alayhi salam is buried in the town of Khalil, of Khalil. 
Likewise, the son of Sayyidina Ibrahim alayhi salam, Sayyidina Ishaq. He came with his father, Ibrahim alayhi salam, to the lands of, Pal of Palestine and he lived and died there. And his, and he is mentioned in the Quran. Then Sayyidina Dawood alayhi salam lived in the lands of Palestine and he was sent forth as a prophet in the lands of Palestine. And he was and he died and was buried in the lands of Par of Palestine. And likewise the likewise the story of David and Goliath that's mentioned in the Quran and Goliath who was a tyrannical ruler who was defeated by whom? Hmm? Hmm. by? by Sayyidina Dawood alayhi salam right? um, as mentioned in Surah Al-Baqarah then Sayyidina Ya'qub alayhi salam Sayyidina Ya'qub alayhi salam, he was also in the lands of Sham and, and Philistine. Okay. Sayyidina Ya'qub, who was the, the son of Sayyidina Ishaq alayhi salam. And the son of Sayyidina Ya'qub, Sayyidina Yusuf alayhi salam, likewise. Okay. And he lived an extended period of time. Sayyidina Yusuf in Egypt. And then he returned back to Palestine. Okay. And he also passed away. Sayyidina Yusuf, Sayyidina Yusuf Joseph. Okay. He returned back to, and was reunited with his family. And he also passed away in the lands of... And of course, the... The modern notion of a nation state is a European fabrication. Right? Lands had multiple names as well. That, so for example, that area is known as Philistine, but it's also part of Bilad al-Sham. So they have multiple usages. Why? Because they were not borders in the modern sense. People would have control, even the local rulers have concern, control, but you said, okay, where exactly is your border? Borders were poor. They weren't borders in that sense. Likewise, Sayyidina Zakaria alayhi salam was born and lived in Palestine. And some, the, the ulama differed as to did Sayyidina Zakaria pass away in Palestine itself or that he had migrated to the northern limits of the lands of Sham and it is, there's a, an opinion that he passed away in what in, you know, in the Islamic period became known as Halab, Aleppo. Um, so the, but we don't know this, but he certainly was born and lived in the lands of Pal Palestine and the uh, stories associated with Sayyidina Zakaria. And what, what city was it? Hmm? What we call Quds and that primordial place of worship okay. and the associated stories. Likewise, Sayyidina Yahya alayhi salam who was the son of Sayyidina Zakaria. Right? He lived in these lands. And then they say that he either died in Damascus or his head was taken to Damascus after he was martyred. And his head is said to be at Masjid al-Umawi. And again, Masjid al-Umawi was established 
formally in the time of the Umayyads, but it is a, pla a place of worship from well before even the biblical tradition. It's one of the great places of divine oneness through human history beyond the mists of time and history. And then Sayyidina Isa ibn Maryam alayhim as -salam, Jesus, the son of Mary, peace and blessings be upon them both. And his mother, Sayyidina Maryam. They lived in that very land. They're born in the vicinity of Jerusalem, in Beit Lahm. And that's where the ascent of Sayyidina, Ibrahim, of Sayyidina Isa alayhi salam to the heavens took place. وَمَا قَتَلُوهُ وَمَا صَلَبُوهُ They neither killed him as the Jewish people claim and they did not crucify him as the Christian people claim. But that's what it appeared to them. But rather Allah raised him to himself. Right. From these very blessed lands. And finally, our Prophet Muhammad وسلم, right, his connection to the lands of Palestine is and we'll see that when we look at the, the virtues of Palestine. That is where his Isra took place from, took place to. It was taken on a magnificent night journey from Masjid al-Haram to Masjid al-Aqsa. Allah subhanahu wa tells us there, and which we blessed the lands around, which we blessed the lands around. And, and then it is from that city that the Prophet ﷺ was granted the most amazing physical miracle granted to any Prophet. The greatest of the miracles of the Prophet ﷺ is the Quran. When the Prophet ﷺ was taken out of this world physically by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with the mi'raj taking place. Right? And all the marvels of both the Isra and the mi'raj took place in and around the lands of Palestine, right? around Jerusalem, Al-Quds. And we'll see in a bit, there's a connection in that too, there's a connection in that also to Gaza, which people don't mention very much, but we'll look at it shortly. Our goal here is not to go into the details of history. These are things you should read about yourself. But the opening of Jerusalem, of Al-Quds, was during the time of Sayyidina Umar, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, and he entered Jerusalem himself, victorious. And the head of the church gave him the keys to the main church there to take it over. And normally a victor, whoever won, would take over. And just as you take over the government and the judiciary, the largest places of worship, you take them over because you won. Now, that's just the norm. Just imagine if one person takes over another, another's land. And I say, no, but I'm going to keep their court. Why? Because, you know, I've taken over. But Sayyidina Omar refused. And you refuse to pray. And people of religion, if you win, you thank God for whatever your conception of God. He didn't. He prayed outside the church. And those churches were preserved. Those churches were preserved. Unlike others who are actively bombing masajid and targeting masajid that are over a thousand years old. Right? And this 
this is something that you should read about how he entered, but also the humility, the faithful humility of a victorious servant of God. Right? He entered Jerusalem like Sayyidina Rasulullah said, entered Mecca victorious. Because these are victories not of ego, but of servitude to God, of faith, of commitment to truth, to justice, to virtue, and good action. So this is just a little bit of the context of, of the significance of Palestine. These, this is a land of Tawheed. This is a land of Tawheed. And just as the significance of Mecca isn't that it's beautiful, not particularly in itself, like remove the Kaaba, it's not a place of some great geographic beauty. It's not a place of wealth, of natural resources. It's a place of Tawheed. Likewise, out of divine wisdom, and Jerusalem was made one of these focal points of Tawheed on earth. And being a focal point of Tawheed, this is why so many prophets were sent there. Why so many prophets were sent there. Now, if, if the first and greatest place of Tawheed is Mecca, why weren't all the prophets sent there? Why weren't all the prophets sent there? Anyone? And those of you who are online are welcome to contribute as well. Why weren't the prophets sent? Very good point, right? That Jerusalem, Al Quds, is at a crossroads of so many civilizations. And, you know, it's not far from the, the Romans and the Persians and the ancient city of Damascus and Egypt and likewise. East Africa, uh, sorry, East Africa and the great civilizations there. It has, it's not far from the lands of the Romans. So this is of tremendous significance in that regards. Whereas Mecca was a barren land. But it's also as if Mecca was left for Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Mecca was left for Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Mecca and Medina, which is why even in our tashahud, what do you say? Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad. O oh Allah, grant your blessings and exaltation upon our master Muhammad and the followers and the people of our master Muhammad as you have blessed Ibrahim. As you've blessed our master Ibrahim, and the people of our master Ibrahim, the people of our master Ibrahim were the prophets. And these were their lands. These were their lands. And that's from the blessing for this ummah. So our connection to Jerusalem is not, it's not a political thing. That these are our lands. Right? Yeah, they are our lands. But they are our lands because we are servants of God. And God has created this earth with a wisdom, which is, وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ I've not created jinn nor humans except that they may be devoted to me. So yes, it, 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 these are our lands. They should be more dear to us than Hyderabad or Lahore or Karachi or whatever, but not because it is ours. It's not about me. It's not about we. It is about him, subhanahu wa ta'ala, about Allah. These are lands of Tawheed. These are our lands because these we are servants of God. And our duty there, it's not a matter of tribalism. It's not a matter of nationalism. It's a matter of truth. 
slavehood to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the qualities that we'll see when we look at the virtues of these lands that have come in the prophetic tradition. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in Surah Al-Isra, right at the opening, Subhana alladhi asra bi'abdihi laylam min al-masjid al-harami ila al-masjid al-aqsa alladhi barakna hawlahu linuriyahu min ayatina innahu huwa al-sami'u al-basir. So the 17th surah of the Qur'an, in its opening, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala declares in the name of Allah, most merciful and compassionate, how gloriously exalted beyond compare is the one who took his honored servant on a night journey from the sacred mosque to the furthest mosque, Masjid al-Aqsa, that we may bounty that we have bounteously blessed everything around so that we may show him something of our enormous signs verily he allah most high is all hearing and all seeing okay. so that night journey is a sign of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and an honoring of his messenger, alayhi salatu salam. But the land to which he went on the night journey to, al-Masjid al-Aqsa, has been blessed. Right? That we have bounteously blessed everything around. What is that everything around? It's their circles. The first circle is Al-Quds itself, then the lands around Al-Quds, which is Palestine, and then the lands around that, which, which are the lands of Sham, the lands of the greater Levant, which themselves have tremendous merit in the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. The Prophet ﷺ said, Allahumma barik lana fi shamina. O oh Allah, bless for us the lands of Sham. And these all have tremendous consequence at the end of time. And this should fill us with optimism as well. Why? Because the Prophet ﷺ foretold of tremendous fitna that will take place at the end of time. And if you think there's great fitna, you ain't seen nothing yet because it's not getting much easier. Right? But it's going to also get much better. And what do we do at the end of time? The Sahaba asked the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that in times of fitna, what should I do? He said, Alaykum bisham, go to the lands of Sham. Right? Because it is Fustatullahi fi ardi. It is the fortress of Allah on earth. And there are tremendous events that will unfold there. Right? And that's the lands of Sham. It, Palestine, and, but in, in the case of the end of time, and particularly Damascus. That's where Sayyidina, it is those lands. That most of the scholars say that the descent of Sayyidina, Isa alayhi salam, will be in Damascus. There is another opinion that it will be in Al-Quds. But the majority opinion is that it will be in Damascus. But all these lands will have tremendous significance at the end of time. And we'll look at some of that. Now what about the Masjid al-Aqsa? Right? We talked about the divine wisdom in making it the second house of worship and its virtue, right? It's a place of Tawheed and it's connected to so many of the prophets and their call of Tawheed. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala swears in the Quran and dedicates an entire surah. And this surah is amazing. And it's amazing how little we connect our current context to what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Quran. We may be reciting this surah, this of the short surahs. Right? And those of you are SLM, like slackers like me, you probably read the short surahs very frequently. So you probably rec recited this several times since the, the recent events have flared up. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala swears in the Quran, Bismillahir Rahman Rahim, Watini wa Zaytun. By the momentous, uh, by 
the fig and the olive, وَطُورِ سِينِينَ and the momentous mount of Sinai, وَهَذَا الْبَلَدِ الْأَمِينَ and by the city, inviolable and sanctified. لَقَدْ خَلَقْنَا الْإِنسَانَ فِي أَحْسَنِ تَقْوِيمِ Verily, we have created man in the fairest of forms. ثُمَّ رَدَدْنَاهُ أَسْفَلَ سَافِلِينَ and then we have reduced them down to the lowest of the despicably low. إِلَّا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ Except those who believe and work righteous deeds. فَلَهُمْ أَجْرٌ غَيْرُ مَمْنُونَ So theirs is an incomparable wage never to wane. فَمَا يُكَذِّبُكَ بَعْدُ بِالدِّينَ أَلَيْسَ اللَّهُ بِأَحْكَمِ الْحَاكِمِينَ So what thereafter could make you cry lies to the very reckoning? Is Allah not then the justest of judges? This tells us Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala swears by the fig and the olive. What is the fig and the olive? If we look in the great books of tafsir, and one of the great tafsir is that of Imam al baghawi who is a great Imam of Hadith, a great Imam of tafsir. And his tafsir was beloved by a lot of the ulama because of its combining between so many of the great traditions of tafsir before it. And his being a, a scholar of tremendous depth, the fig is mentioned first because the fig right, is the fig itself. It is a blessed and beneficial fruit. And this is one of the interpretations given by Sayyidina Ibn Abbas. It's a blessed and truly beneficial fruit that Allah has placed all kinds of benefits in. And one of the other reasons that have come from the early Muslims that the teen has been mentioned, the fig has been mentioned, because it's a pure fruit. The whole of it, the whole of the fruit itself can be eaten. Most fruits you have to get, get rid of the seed or this or that, this. The entirety of it, is, of it is of benefit. So there are many points of reflection in the fig itself of how you should be as a believer. That there shouldn't be anything. Just think about it. the mango is a pretty good, pretty amazing fruit. Can you eat the whole mango? No, you have to get rid of the skin. Anyone eat mango skin here? No. It's got this big pit in the middle, etc. Apples, pears, think of most of the fruits. There's a, a marvel to it. In that. Plus, there's all kinds of unique benefits to it. That's one aspect. But the other interpretation of the fig is that it refers to Damascus and the mount of Damascus. And some of the ulama just said it's the mountain by Damascus. And some said this specifically because of other hadiths mentioning its merit is Jabal Qasyun, which has come in many, many hadiths of our beloved Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Said other, others of the early Muslims said it's referring to the mosque of Damascus because it is one of the focal points of Tawheed, even in prehistory, in, in, in pre-Islamic history. So the fig refers to the lands of Sham broadly or Damascus in particular or the mountain of Damascus. But also the fig itself is, a, is something to reflect upon. It's marvelous. And everything Allah swears by in the Quran deserves our reflection. 
because he tells us elsewhere in the Quran, and truly it is an oath. Were you to but know, tremendous. And that's what religious understanding is, is to gain benefit that is lasting. Was zaytun and the olive. One of the meanings of the olive is the olive itself. Yuqadu min shajaratim mubaraka. It is lit from a tree that is blessed. Zaytuna, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in Surah An Nur, in the verses of light. Right? That the metaphor of faith in the believer's heart is like a lamp in a niche that is lit from, by oil from a tree truly blessed. And that's the olive tree. لا ولا Neither of the east nor of the west. And the land of... So it's referring to the olive. And the Prophet ﷺ said in the hadith in Bukhari, in um, Sunan Abi Dawood and elsewhere, that it is a truly blessed tree. So eat of its fruit, meaning the, the olive itself, and use it as oil. And use it as oil. Of course, use it doesn't mean abuse it. Right? And this is truly blessed by the witness of the Prophet. ﷺ. So it's. But it also, as the Imam al Baghawi relates from many of the early authorities, it's referring to Al Quds in specific, and the mount, famous as the Mount of Olives, overseeing Al-Quds, and the lands of Palestine more broadly, the lands around Al-Quds. It is mentioned by Imam Muhi sunnah Al-Baghawi in his great tafsir. So Allah swears by those lands, the lands of Sham and Damascus, and that's a separate matter those are special lands but also by the the land of the fig and the olive okay of course these are two fruits that you know the fig and the olive that we should reflect on but also use out of you know, and to appreciate but allah swears by the lands of these two great fruits and we mean fruit in the general sense. This is not a scientific discussion. Is that the olive a fruit or whatever it is? Right. But Surah at teen also tells us about the wi divine wisdom of tests. Right. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, Verily we have created man in the fairest of symmetry. We have been granted, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Quran, the لَقَدْ كَرَّمْنَا بَنِي آدَمُ We have honored the children of Adam. Why? Because he has given us intellects. He has given us the capacity to choose. He has given us, within us, the capacity for virtue. But also the capacity for vice. وَنَفْسٍ وَمَا سَوَاهَا by the self. Allah swears by the human self. And he swears by how Allah fashioned it. Granting it the capacity both for its vice, the worst of its vice, and the greatest of its virtue and its taqwa. So here, what's the purpose of, these, of the test of life? That you have a self. You can be the most wretched of God's creation if you allow yourself to slip into the worst of human potential, the fujur, the unrestrained corruption, wrongdoing, transgression, ingratitude, or mindfulness of God and the resultant virtue and righteous action. Yet, 
we have turned him back to the lowest of the despicably low, right? the unrestrained human tendency. Right? So we are created with the potential for both vice and virtue. But you, if the human being just lets themselves be unguided by faith, by commitment to truth, by commitment to just action, by lack of commitment for what is pleasing to God, then we have allowed them to return to the lowest of the despicably low. Not because Allah made them that way, but because that is the moral choice that we as human beings can make. It's not an accident that this is in the context of the lands of Sham and the lands of Palestine. That there's potential for both wretched, miserable vice right, to the lowest of the despicably low. And it's not because Allah has made people this way, but these are the choices that they make. These are the choice. Allah has created the human being in the very best of potentiality. But it is by the moral choices, right? the choices driven by pride arrogance, conceit, lust for power, lust for wealth, worldliness, ego, whim, unconcern for truth, for what is right, virtuous, or good. One can become the most despicable of the despicably low. But then there's an exception. <inaudible> Save those who believe and work righteous deeds. This is the struggle for Palestine. And this is how victory is manifest. But the victory is not whether you take over the land or you don't. The victory is not whether you're in charge or you're not. Victory is victory over this base human corruptness. Save those who believe and work righteous deeds. Theirs is an incomparable wage, never to wane, because it is not, where is reward? Reward is in the hereafter. So what thereafter could make you cry lies to the very reckoning? None of this makes sense. Many of you have seen, and avoid looking at the dead. What of this father wearing a turban? Right? Holding his infant. But look at his smiling face. And between us and you is the reckoning. Right? And the one who knows that They've lost someone who's martyred. And you know the promise of Allah is true and the reckoning is real. Then what are we worried about with respect to such people? <laughs> For is Allah not then the justest of judges? Right? So this is the test of the lands of Palestine. It's a test of human potential. These are, the land, these are lands that Allah Most High has blessed. But it is a divine promise. Right? The reality of this life is that, it, we have, that this world has been created as a test. He has created death and life to test you. The people most intensely tested are the prophets themselves. And in one narration, the Prophet said, then the best after them, and then the best after them. 
in another narration, ثم الصالح, ثم الأنبياء, ثم الصالحون, the prophets and then the righteous after them. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us about the prophets, their tests are not like our, our small tests. وَزُلْزِلُوا And they were shaken as if by an earthquake. But of course Allah's promise there is, فَلَإِنَّ نَصْرَ اللَّهِ قَرِيبٌ right? The victory of Allah is very close. But victory is not in this life. The prophets were victorious. Allah tells us, truly we will make our prophets victorious. There were prophets that nobody believed in them. They will stand alone on the day of resurrection. There will be others, well, just a handful of people. Sayyidina Nuh alayhi salam. مَا آمَنُوا مِنْهُمْ إِلَّا قَلِيل None believed of them except but few. In the hundreds of years of calling, they say, and the numbers differ, 30 to 40 committed believers. Perhaps 70 or 80 of those who claim to believe. It's not a matter of numbers or, or appearances. And this is the spiritual test for us as individuals in life and in such matters. But also that's the test of the, the issue of Palestine. And this is also what is manifest. You see, I was talking yesterday with Ustad Mustafa al-Azawi, and he is here because he, you know, he's displaced from one of the great blessed lands of Islam, al-Iraq. But he was saying that our land have been, has been tested, particularly you know, the, you know, the, the Sunni Muslims there, particularly, but in general, it's been tested. He said, but nobody that I'm aware of has responded to tests, whether the learned or the religious or the irreligious or the common person, like the people of Gaza. It's stunning. Where else do people go to bury their children, but they are smiling and content and belie this faith and certitude and trust in Allah and the resolve to continue? that these people have. It is amazing. It is amazing. And in it are lessons. And we should reflect on Surah At-Teen. There are numerous other wisdoms in it for us in general, but also with respect to tests like this. There are numerous hadiths of our beloved Prophet on Palestine. Amongst them, of course, is the reality that the, the hadith of Sahih Muslim that we related from Abu Dhar, that, this, that the Masjid al-Aqsa, that, and that Masjid refers to the place of worship. It does not refer to the, the, those specific walls. Okay? That place of worship. Right? The second mosque was Masjid al-Aqsa. And there are numerous hadiths on the blessedness of the lands of Sham, and Palestine is from the lands of Sham. And we've mentioned the, the Quranic verses related to, to, to Palestine, but in the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu you know, that Allah has blessed Sham and has blessed Yemen. Right? And it is the fortress of God on earth. Right? It is also, we have all the, had, the hadiths that mention the Isra and Mi'raj, and describe it. And we know what took place in Jerusalem, and the prophets were waiting for our beloved messenger, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, there at Masjid Al-Aqsa, for the Prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, to lead them. And it is from there that our beloved, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, ascended in body and soul to the heavens. It's come in prophetic tradition, in multiple hadiths, that prayer at the Aqsa Mosque is superior to a hundred prayers in other mosques. It's also come in prophetic tradition that لا تشد الرحال إلا لثلاث That one does not go on a pilgrimage 
except to three, namely Masjid al-Haram and the Mosque of the Prophet ﷺ and Masjid al-Aqsa. And some people misinterpret that, that you can't make any other religious journey. No, that's absurd. Right? What it refers to is that there are three places that have inherent merit, that have inherent merit. Otherwise, the Sahaba, you know, there's Sahaba who heard that another Sahabi had heard a hadith directly from the Prophet ﷺ. And this Sahabi had heard it indirectly from the Messenger of Allah ﷺ. The Sahabi had heard it from another Sahabi. So, it, my, so traveled from Medina all the way to Damascus just to hear it directly from the one who heard it from Rasulullah ﷺ. And this is not by taking a bus or a train or a plane. This is traveling by camel and on foot from Medina to Damascus. Just to, for one hadith. Okay, so that hadith, but it, that points to the tremendous merit of, of Palestine. It's also come, of course, in, there's numerous other hadiths. And we did a, a lesson on the merits of Jerusalem in Islam, and you can see that bi ta'ala. And many of the events of the final days will re revolve around the lands of Palestine. But Gaza itself, some people say, well, Gaza is not that significant. And, but that's not the case. Firstly, Gaza on its own as a town is thousands of years old. And it partakes in that sacred history. Partakes in that sacred history. Numerous prophets went through it. Numerous people of Tawheed lived and believed and worshipped in that, in this blessed town. And a lot of people aren't aware that it has, Gaza has multiple points of connection to our beloved messenger, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. To him directly, the Prophet ﷺ prayed during the night journey just outside Gaza. And it's come in the Musnad al Shamiin of Al Tabarani. And it's mentioned by Imam al Bayhaqi in Dala'il al Nubuwa with his chain of narration regarding the, the uh, Isra and Mi'raj that. Before reaching Jerusalem, he was, they stopped outside of Jerusalem at Median, at Median. And the Prophet Hassan prayed two rakahs there, right? at the tree of Sayyidina Musa, alayhi salam. And Imam al-Bayhaqi said that this hadith is sahih. It's a sahih hadith in the narration of Isra that the night journey, the Prophet ﷺ prayed in several places on the way to reaching Al-Aqsa. He also prayed at Yathrib, which later was to become Medina to Nabi wasallam, And he prayed in Median. The author of Asir al Halabiya, one of the greatest reference works of the biography of the Prophet, وسلم, said that when it's come in the narration that he prayed, the Prophet وسلم, said, I prayed at Median. He said, It is a town just by Gaza, in the Shajarati Musa, where the tree of Moses is. That's come in the Quran. So this is one of the merits that many people don't realize. That this is as a direct connection to our beloved messenger, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Why? Because these are lands of Tawheed. It's also come that Asqalan is the graveyard of 70,000 who enter paradise without reckoning, as is come in the Musnad of Imam Ahmad, 
and elsewhere. That the Prophet ﷺ told us that there are 70,000 of my ummah who will enter paradise without reckoning. And it's come that with every 70,000, there will be 70,000 more. The ulama have speculated, what does it mean? Some said that perhaps what it means is that somehow their souls are connected to that land. Others said no. There will be 70,000 martyrs buried there. But we don't know. This has come in authentic hadiths. It's also come in the hadith of the Prophet There are multiple narrations of this. That the best of ribat, the best of fortification in jihad is that of asqalan. And many of the um, towns of Palestine have been renamed by the, the Zionist occupiers there. And Asqalan, Ashkelon or whatever they call it, is just next to Gaza. And they're overlapping. That area would be called Asqalan and Gaza. You could refer to this being part of this or this being part of that. And this hadith, it's part of a longer hadith that the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Asqalan and is one of the two brides, one of the two brides, Ahadul Arusain. From it, on the day of resurrection, will go forth 70,000 who will have no reckoning upon them before they enter paradise. And from it, 50,000 martyrs will come forth, said the Prophet Sallallahu And they will go directly to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And in it are rows upon rows of martyrs whose heads will be in their own hands. And they will declare, Rabbana amanna. Afwan, Rabbana atina ma wa'attana. That, O Lord, grant us what you have promised to your messengers. For you do not break your promise. So Allah Most High will declare to those people of the Arusain, of Asqalan, and the other Arus is Gaza itself, as we'll see in the next narration. Allah Most High will declare, Sadaqa Abidi, my Devoted servants have been true. Okay. He said, and, and it'll be said, and Allah will declare, wash them in the radiant river. So they come out from it pure and radiant. And then they roam the gardens of paradise wherever they wish. And this is not just some fanciful hadith, this is in the Musnad of Imam Ahmad from Sayyidina Anas ibn Malik. And it's also come that, that the Darusain, the two brides are Asqalan and Gaza. And the Prophet Sallallahu also prayed for those of the graveyard. So the Sahaba asked, you mean al baqiyah which is the blessed graveyard, where is Al Baqiyah? Hmm? Really? Prayed for those of Al Baqiyah. So the Sahab asked, Who are the people of the graveyard? So are they the people of Baqiyah? The Prophet repeated that Allah bless the people of the graveyard. So they asked, What is the what, who are the people of the graveyard? And they asked three times. And the Prophet ﷺ said, Maqbaratu Asqalan, the graveyard of Asqalan, which is literally 
next door to Gaza and it's from the lands of Palestine. And it's also in the, the Prophet Sallallahu promised that this, this matter is prophethood and mercy. And then they will be rightly guided and merciful khilafa after me. And then there will be kingship with mercy. Then there will be then there will be political authority that has mercy. And then people will gather upon you like donkeys gather. Right? You bring out the feed, the donkeys come, and many animals are a bit sensi sensible. They kind of come, but apparently donkeys, if the food comes, they just rush almost blindly. The people gather upon you like donkeys gather upon the feed. Never seen it. The Prophet ﷺ said, فَعَلِيكُمْ jihad." So, hold fast to striving in the way of Allah. And he said, and the best of jihad is, for, is fortifying oneself. And the best of fortification is your fortification in Asqalan. Right? In those, in that in Asqalan itself, and you know, Gaza, which is right next to it. And this is in the Mu'jam al Kabir of Al Tabarani. Of course, there's another point of connection to our beloved Prophet, وسلم, which is that the great grandfather of the Prophet, the great great grandfather of the Prophet, وسلم, Sayyidina Hashim Amr. That's why he, a lot of people are called Amr Hashim, because he had two names. Like the descendants of the Prophet ﷺ, he was born in Mecca. And then he lived an extended period of time in Yathrib, in modern day Medina, amongst Bani Najjar. And it is there that he was known as Al Badr, the full moon, this great. Ancestor of the Prophet Sallallahu Hashim, was known as Al-Badr. Because they said that in the dark of night, he is like the full moon in his beauty, in his character, in his virtue, in his care, in his concern, in his righteousness, in his charity, in his giving. Which, which is why... When the Prophet ﷺ entered Medina, it is the, the young girls of Bani Najjar who sang out, Tala al Badru alayna, the full moon has risen over us. Because one of the ways, particularly the Arabs, would praise someone, as they said, Man shabaha abahu fama zalam, the one who resembles their father has done no wrong. That's Sayyidina Hashim the great great grandfather of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam but then from yathrib where did he go to he went to gaza that's why historically one of the names that gaza was known by was gazat hashim the gaza of hashim and he is buried there al bad and he was known as al badr so when you recite tala al badr alayna there's a connection between that and the one the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was compared to His great grandfather in Tala al Badr alina. But this is another point of connection with Gaza. Gaza, though a small town through history, its population welled up in the after you know in the 20th century as the usurpation of the Palestinian lands began and their displacement, a lot of them went to Gaza and this escalated. So it's ma you know it's multiplied beyond measure in size, but Gaza produced great Islamic scholarship. And we're not there to, right from the age of the Tabi'een, of the early Muslims, but most notably, one of the founders of one of the four schools of 
mainstream Sunni Islam, Imam Muhammad ibn Idris al-Shafi'i was from the Salaf, of course. He's born in the year 150 and died 204 Hijri. He was born in Gaza. And then he had to migrate there with very difficult circumstances. But then he, he used to yearn for, for Gaza and he wrote poetry and that he longed for it, but it's a land of tribulations. And he said, if, if I cannot go there, but I could get a little of its soil, I would anoint my eyes with it. Of course, hyperbole, right? Hyperbole. But that's how dear it is to me, that I'd put it right next to my eyes. Like you apply kuhul, like kahaltu biha, aini. I would adorn my eyes with it. And throughout Islamic history, there's been many, many great scholars who were from Gaza. Amongst them, late, much later in Islamic history, is one of the great imams of Hanafi fiqh, Imam At-Tumurtashi. And I'm presently teaching in, in one, an advanced level four class his work, Tanwir al-Absar. And he's also known as Al-Ghazi. Him and his children and his family produced many great scholars and many, many other great scholars. Some who remained in those lands, some who had to migrate to other lands. So there's countless scholars. We don't want to go into the details. It's been a place of great scholarship. Uh, sadly, due to the turbulence in those lands, many of them had to migrate to other lands, given the upheavals that throughout history would happen in these lands. Because if Allah loves the people, he sends them trials. That's just the nature of life. So this is a little bit about the fada'il, the virtues of the lands of Sham. We are going to, uh, the, the lands of Palestine, and secondly, the land of Gaza itself. Just to recap before we take a 10 minute break, the first thing to keep in mind is that the, connect, the virtue of Palestine relates to the very purpose of life, which is, وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ I have not created jinn nor humans, except that they may be humbly devoted to me for ibadah. And the beginning of worship is to know God and to believe in God. Secondly, is to submit to God and turn to Him. And third, is to act on his guidance, seeking his love and closeness. Right. Palestine is the land of the second house of worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, second center of Tawheed on earth, and it's divine wisdom that the, the great prophets of the last days, those mentioned in the Quran, a large portion of them lived and were born and lived and worshipped and called to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in those same lands. Why? Because of this great wisdom that we've explained. But in that blessed land, we see the unfolding of the divine warning in Surah at teen that we will see manifest there both the worst of human vice and corruption and abasement by human choice, but also the greatest of manifestations of what it means to be a believer, except those who believe and do righteous deeds. And theirs will be reward, ceaseless and undiminishing. Right? And Allah reminds us, So what then could make you deny the reality of Allah's reckoning? And the, there are multiple interpretations. What could make you deny the reality of divine reckoning? Or what would make you then deny the truth of religion itself? But the two are related. Because religion is what you, is how you prepare for the ultimate reckoning. Alayhi sallahu bi ahkam al-hakimin. 
Is Allah not the most just of judges? So don't worry about the oppressor and their oppression. oppression. They've lost already, eternally, unless they cease and desist. So we're going to pause for 10 minutes and continue with parts 3 and 4. In parts 3, we're going to look at, very briefly, just a conceptual overview of what happened that got us here. But that's not the focus, and we're going to close with how do we respond to the, the situation at hand. So we'll take that after a 10-minute break. Bidhnillahi ta'ala. Barakallahu ta'ala feekum. اللهم صل على سيدنا وحبيبنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا Yeah.
Ya Habibi Ya
Dissent was fomented throughout the 19th century and discontent and economic and social hardship in Syria and elsewhere, in modern day Syria, in the lands of Sham, and also amongst the tribes of what is now modern day Jordan, and which is also how from that discontent that existed in the lands of Sham, the discontent that existed in the lands of Palestine, in what is modern day Jordan, etc., that later a number of ways of dividing the Ummah and securing European political, economic, and other interests were facilitated. So the Arab rebellion arose in the Arabian Peninsula that led to the loss of, of, of Ottoman control over um, and the rise of the, South, of the Wahhabis and the Saudi uh, kingdom, right, which arose as a rebellion against the Ottomans 
and likewise in many of these lands. However, it also led to a weakening of the political infrastructure in those lands and a weakening of the economic infrastructure of those lands. So the 19th century saw also migration away from Sham and Palestine to other lands. Why? Due to the economic hardship arising from this political weakness of authority. Now that's, that's a reality. And this escalated in the latter, you know, and as the Ottomans had lost more and more control and many other factors, we don't want to go into a whole history, that's why you see so much migration happening from Sham, for example, from what's modern day Syria, to um, South America, for example, right? That took place in the 19th century. And there's a lot of internal unrest that arose too, because when you, there's economic upheaval, people turn on each other as well. So there were unusually for places like Damascus, but also unusually for the lands of Palestine, there's you know, quite a lot of interreligious tensions that arose as well. And some people migrated out because of these as well. And you can see that. During this period, the majority of the population of Palestine was clearly um, Muslim, but they were significant Christian and Jewish and a small but well-established Jewish presence there. And from the time of, and this is an important part to be clear of, right, that the, that no human civilization has ever treated its minorities with the degree of recognition of rights and fulfillment of rights that the Muslims have, ever. And present um, claims to human rights and all these things and equality under the law, etc., notwithstanding. Right? Across the Muslim world, this is not something related specifically to Palestine or the lands of Sham or anywhere, but it is very significant that across the Muslim world, if you practice another, another religion, you could conduct your own marriages and divorces and personal law as you wished. Even in ways that we would consider absolutely abhorrent. And it shocks the wits out of people, but it's there in, in our books of fiqh that if there are people who in their faith tradition, a brother can marry a sister or a son a mother. Do we go and annul their marriage? Do we take them to, to jail? No. If that's what they hold true amongst themselves, we let them be. And we let them resolve their matters of marriage, divorce, inheritance, etc. amongst themselves as they so wish. We hold certain things to be the pinnacle of human vice, like alcohol, particularly wine. But we do not stop non-Muslims from having these things. They are allowed to conduct their social laws as they wish, as long as they do not spread them, do not do these things publicly, nor spread them amongst the Muslims. And it's very important to be aware of that. And you see tremendous examples of that in the lands of Palestine as well. The, the, from the time of Sayyidina Umar ibn Khattab, we talked about the opening of of Jerusalem, but then later as well. When Jerusalem was reconquered by Salah al-Din al-Ayyubi. These are things we should be familiar with. When the, when the Crusaders took over, when the European Christian Crusaders took over the lands of Palestine, and not just Jerusalem, but the lands of Palestine, they brutally murdered not just the Muslims, even the local Christians, because they considered them heathens too. And there are, you can read about it in many books about the Crusades through Arab eyes and so on, and read the accounts, like by Amin Malo, many, many, many works on the subject. There are actually more scholarly than that, but 
and he works on the Crusades through the perspective of the Arabs in general. And read what the Christian Arabs had to say about the Crusaders and what they did. And the degree of bloodshed that was inflicted upon the Muslim population of Jerusalem or the Jewish population just almost wiped out when the Crusaders took over. But then how Salah al-Din al-Ayyubi conquered. And Salah al-Din al-Ayyubi was not doing anything that's unique to him. He was someone who was simply striving to act in accordance with prophetic teachings. And that was the nature of the overwhelming trajectory of Muslim history with respect to the victorious. When they followed the teachings that they were called upon to uphold as Muslims, as people who are expected to follow the Prophet But we have an overwhelmingly admirable history. There are those who acted in the most brutal of ways too, that those are their failings. And you can reflect on Surat at teen to see where that is coming from. And we talked about that. But this reality that these were lands where under the people of Tawheed, the rights of people were res respected. The rights of the other faiths were respected as they are now. Some of the most sacred of churches in Palestine, the keys to them are under Muslim custodians. Because there's so many different Christian denominations who are fighting over it for so long. They just settled historically that we'll give the keys to the Muslims. Because they will be just and they will take care of the rights. That is our history. That is our history. But in this time of political weakening of the Muslim center, but also there's another reality which is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Quran that تِلْكَ الْأَيَّامِ نُدَاوِلُهَا بَيْنَ النَّاسِ That these are the days that we alternate amongst people. These are the days that we alternate between people. And tadawul is to go around. We have that there's a cyclical nature to history. There's a cyclical nature to power. There's a cyclical nature to the powerful, to empires. That they rise and there's factors for which, by which empires rise. And there's factors by which empires diminish. And then, if they survive, that they may return. And Ibn Khaldun commented on that with great brilliance in his Muqaddimah, the prolegomena of Ibn Khaldun. And it's translated into English, and it has, it's a brilliant work, even in translation, has many, many insights. Also, you want insights on children's education, you find that in the prolegomena of Ibn Khaldun, there's some fascinating insights there as well. And that's just the nature of what Allah tells us. That's the nature, the cyclical nature of history, of power, of societies. But this is the outward. The heart of a civilization is its faith, its commitment to truth, its commitment to justice, its virtue, and how its people act. These are, this is the reality of history. There's a form to history. There's an ebb and flow to material fortunes. But the true history is history of the light of faith and its fruits in the lives of people. And part of the test of life is that there be this ebb and flow. That when you are outwardly victorious, how will, will you act virtuously? When you are weak, how will you, will you return to God? That is the, the true reality. And we covered that. We, we did a seminar during 
the COVID times on um, the on on history. Right? What is our the concept of history in Islam? Right? Looking at you know what Sayyid Abdul Hassan Ali Nadwi and others describe. And there's a wonderful work on that topic, whose English translation, whose English title is Islam and the World, by Sayyid Abdul Hassan Ali Nadwi. The Arabic title is Ma Khasir Al Alam Bin Hitat Al Muslimin. What the world lost with the uh, decline of the Muslims. And it's a brilliant work, worth reading, and we covered the, the thematic overview of that in our course on uh, the, you know, the concept of history. You can find it in the on-demand courses. And within this, there was without doubt a clear weakening of religious practice amongst both the, lay, the common believers and the, the, uh, the elites of society in these lands and in other lands. And that's also a divine promise. That in Allah la yughayru bi qawmin hatta yughayru ma bi anfusihim. Allah does not change the state of a people until they change what is within themselves. And that's true for the weakness that befell the Muslims around the world. And one of the wisdoms of that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us is so that we, they may return back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Whether it be the, the d decline of the Mughals, right, which was fomenting for a period of time, but it was particularly manifest in the 19th century, the Mughals in India, and culminating in the fall of Delhi. There is an external element that we are not responsible for as, an, as individuals or as an ummah. We are not responsible for what the British did in India. But as an ummah, we must take lessons on what happened within us as a collective that led to that weakness. And it's also worth reading, for example, Malik bin Nabi, who has many interesting insights, but he said, that in order for people to be colonized, they first have to be colonizable. And they, and they acquire what he referred to in translation as a colonized mindset. But if, because if you were strong in faith and in, in truth and in what the faith is calling on you to conduct yourself as individuals and as a collective, then you would not lose. And that is something that's very important when we read history. We are not. Everyone will act according to their own interests. If they didn't, they're fools. It, if you go to a dog and say, excuse me, dog sahab, please don't bark. Everyone. Each will act according to how they are. You know, you buy it, you know, Brother Ahmed buys a donkey and he's, he says, okay, he invites the donkey for lunch. He says, so, how are things going? The donkey won't respond because it, it can't talk. He says, I gave you food, talk. No, people act according to their, to how they are. And people are the sum of their choices. People are the sum of their choices. So while we recognize that these, there's external forces, increasingly in the 19th century, the Muslim men, much of, many of the Muslim lands became outright colonized in different ways, whether it be the, you know, the Dar al-Islam that was India, or what happened, the very strange set of events that happened with Napoleon entering Egypt and so many of the other lands and the instability in this region. We also need to look at, and this is something to reflect on and I encourage you and we'll look at, to read our history to look at what are the changes at the level of individuals and societies that we need to make now. There's no merit in going blaming people in the past. Tilka ummatun qad khalat. Those are people who have come and gone. 
لها ما كسبت. They have what they acquired, whether of good or ill. ولكم ما كسبتم. But you have what you acquire, whether of good or bad. That is the, the question to ask ourselves when we read history. During this time, there was a, the arise of Zionism in Europe. And it was secular and nationalist more than it was religious in nature. Right? But they were, this was connected with the sense that many of the Jewish peoples had and have of them being the chosen people. The chosen people. Now we know that this is something that Allah granted Bani Israel. And we, there are many cases to make about differentiating between Bani Israel and yeah, the, the citizens of, of, of Israel now. That's a separate discussion. But, but the sense of being the chosen people. They were honored people because they were people of Tawheed and they were people who were granted prophets and their honor was if they followed their prophets. That is the honor. It's not an intrinsic honor. And it goes back to Surah At-Teen. إِلَّا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ Except those who believe and who do righteous deeds, who act with virtue and do good. Those are the people of felicity. And those who are not, they're asfal as safilin They're the worst of the worst, whoever they may be. But this rise of Zionism, particularly late in the 19th century and early in the 20th century, connected with the interests of European powers. Because increasingly, there was a loss of their actual empires or an increasing re realization that there is instability in these lands. And they also wanted the Jewish peoples out because, because of the rise of na nationalism and the sense of, and the entrenchment of the modern notion of the nation state, that there was a further and more focused flare-up of anti-Semitism, of anti-Jewish sentiment. And this anti-Jewish sentiment existed amongst the Christians as a matter of church doctrine. And it was part of both Catholic and Protestant principles of belief to blame the Jewish peoples for the killing of Christ, of Sayyidina Isa alayhi salam. Of course, this side absurdity that you, you believe that he is God, but that someone killed him, that is a separate matter that, you know, just we'd invite them to read Surah Al-Ikhlas and reflect on it. But this was deeply entrenched in the very underlying values of, in Europe, that these are the people who killed Christ. Now, we don't believe in inherited sin. But with the rise of secular nationalism, many of these sentiments were aggravated. And there are many other factors from this, but this was fomenting. And there was attempts in the latter part of the 19th century to convince Sultan Abdul Hamid, for example, to, who was, by clear historical accounts, an unusual, pious, principled ruler who did his utmost best to serve the people of the Ottoman Empire that he had charge of and who had a deep faith commitment. And we also have to be careful whose accounts of history we read. I mean, he was by no means a perfect man, like, um, but he absolutely refused any concession of the lands of Palestine.
to establish a Zionist state. However, then the Great European War, often called the First World War, happened. And after the First World War, the lands of what the Europeans refer to as the Middle East, particularly the, the Arabian lands, were divvied up like trays of candy amongst the European powers. Okay, with a sort of paternalism. Now, some of this was also as a result, whose side did the Ottomans take? The German side. And the Germans lost. So these lands were divvied up post First World War amongst the the European powers, and the British had sway over the lands of Palestine and other lands. And there you can read up about the history that they wanted, they considered amongst their problems, we need to get rid of this Jewish problem. They didn't particularly want the, the Jewish peoples in the various European countries, nor did the British. The, the Jewish peoples, being a minority, had gained considerable power an influence, particularly economic, but there was a lot of, with the underlying hatred of the Jew, the other, and all these things, and then their increasing financial strength, particularly because, and these, because from the earlier Middle Ages, the Jewish people's usury, riba, was all human societies have spoken against riba, against usury. In and usury is prohibited both in the Jewish tradition and in the Christian tradition. A usurer would be excommunicated by the church. And at some times in Europe, it was actually a capital offense for you to be providing usurious loans in the early, earlier half of the, in the earlier part of the Middle Ages. And that's why banks are called banks. Because you, you would, in, if you wanted a riba based loan, you would go outside the city and it was frequently the Jewish peoples because they held that you could give such loans to the Gentiles, to the non-Jews. But then others got involved in the act too. It was, you know, who were less scrupulous or unscrupulous Christians. But because they initially they did not necessarily have buildings, etc., because this was, and this was, an excommunicable offense. So they had bank, they had like benches, on which they engaged in their trade, so, but this led to resentment because they accumulated a lot of wealth. So there's all these sentiments that gathered, sentiments that boiled over in Germany with, the, with Hitler and the Nazis. And you know, the, the clear, you know, the, you know, the, the Holocaust of the Jews, which is very real there, but this anti-Semitism Plus this interest that, okay, how do we gain control over the Middle East? Particularly when you consider the reality that we are now, you know, having to withdraw from some of these places. There's a realization that we will not be able to hold on to this, to these lands. early 20th century was already clear to the British that our empire is coming to its end. They did not have, particularly post-World War, the military strength to be able to control the vast swathes of their own land. And so many, a territory had already escaped British rule. The Australians and, and others were all independent. India was, you know, the it was becoming increasingly clear that it was a matter of 
years, if not decades, that they would lose India. But how do we have control? You know, it's about power and, and money, particularly with the emergence of a reality in the early 20th century that a key, the key fuel for an industrial age is found right there in Arabia, which is oil. And that became very clear. So the interests of particularly the British and the Americans was that we need to gain control. And one of the ways you gain control is what's called strategic destabilization. We need somehow to create sufficient instability in this region that it can be clearly not under Ottoman control or local control or anything else, but rather we want to be the ones who tap into this wealth. And, and we want our local post-colonial partners in charge here. And in that, giving the Jewish people out of no great love for them, the people who promulgated things like the Balfour Declaration and other declarations had, you know, they despised the Jew, you know, Judaism and the Jewish peoples, and they didn't think much of Zionism either, but rather it served their interests. So in all of that, there, there emerged a progressive attempt facilitated by the British and the Americans and various church groups had a very bizarre interest in facilitating that. Why? Because Armageddon will be facilitated according to them and the coming of the Messiah, etc. after a range of events, that, which is why the Christian right now in America you know, who have the most bizarre views about Jews and who know that committed Jews have, you know, like you can read, you know, Ben Shapiro was asked in an, in an interview, and he's a co committed, you know, believer in Judaism. And what do you believe about Christ? And he just said he, he was a Jewish man who, became, who, was, a, who was a criminal. Waliyadu right? billah. But there is this bizarre partnership for their interests. But our focus should not be why, uh, why others do what they do, but what do we do and what we must do. And this led to the progressive migration of Jewish peoples into Palestine. And when it, while under British authority all the way from, you know, the first Euro Great European War, and to the second, all the way till the creation of the Zionist state, you see a clear collusion between the British power there and the displacement of Palestinians, forced and treacherous, and the migration of European and other Jewish peoples into Palestine. And then 1948 happened, and the Nakba and the terrible imposition of a post-colonial post state upon the lands of the Palestinians, right? with systematic death and destruction and erasure of entire towns. I lived for a period of time, for seven years, in Jordan, and there are, I have m many friends who are whose parents, whose grandparents were from towns in Palestine that have been wiped away. That's now a hospital and a parking lot. And it was their ancestral home for, for thousands of years, for I mean, thousands of years, for the whole Islamic phase, but that's where their lineage goes back. And it's not like they left, but they were forced out. They were forced out. And, we, and we're not going to go into the details of that, but we need to be aware of that history. And, be, and why are, the Palestinian, are some Palestinian people responding 
the way they are? And why are things the way they are? We also need to understand the ideologies driving the oppressor. How do they view the Palestinian peoples? People talk about human rights. Do they believe in giving any rights to those humans? We need to be aware of who is funding what? Who is paying for the bombs that destroy Gaza that have been? Whose equipment digs up those olive trees in the occupied territories that builds, whose construction companies build the settlements, the illegal settlements by international law that have made any prospect of peace so far-fetched. So we need to be aware of that. But there is their historical circumstances to the post-colonial weakness of both the Arabs and the Muslims. And these weak nation states left post-World War I in the Muslim world, what used to be a mighty empire of the, you know, of the, of the Ottomans, reduced to a militantly secular, militantly nationalist, uh, inward-looking regime like that of Ataturk's Turkey. And the weakened shadow states of Syria, of Egypt, even though Egypt, given its size, had some attempt for a period of time, Egypt was actually governing what is now you know, the, the area of Gaza, and so on. You can read about that history, but they were weak, and they did not have the kind of military support and funding that the Zionists had and continue to have, but also the, you know, the Zionists, a large percentage of whom were and are atheists, which is very ironic, particularly in the land of Tawheed, but that's where None of the surrounding Muslim states, and with largely stooge governments, including Saudi and others, who all were set up as they are now to serve, to, to ensure destabilization in the region, and that the economic and political interests of the European powers, and we'd include America and the European powers, be preserved. We need to be aware of that. However, we need to look at what is our duty? What is our duty? Because change happens from within. That is the divine promise. That Allah does not change the condition of a people, whether you as an individual or us collectively as an ummah, until they change what is within themselves as individuals and as a collective. That is where the question arises, that what, what is our duty towards Palestine and why Palestine matters. And the first of the lessons in that is the reality of Tawheed, that Palestine is not a national matter, not for the, Palest not for the Palestinians, nor for the Ummah. We are not Bani Islam. We are not a tribe called Islam. We're not a tribe called the Muslims. We are Muslims because we submit to God. There's a friend of mine who's a learned American scholar. We were once at the, a particular conference of one of the large national organizations. And he said, I'm really worried. He said, I said, why? He said, you would think that we worship Islam. What do you mean? He said, where is Allah in all of this? Right? We are not Muslims as an identity, that I'm Muslim because I follow Islam. I'm Muslim because you know, I ascribe myself to the Muslim community because we are Muslims. It's not a tribal identity. Someone could say they're Punjabi or they're Syrian or they're Balochi or they're Colombian or Venezuelan or whatever they are. 
We are Muslim because a Muslim is one who submits to Allah. And this is why even modern vocabulary of religious discourse has shifted in concerning ways. People talk about you know, that we invite people to Islam. What is Islam? It's not some group that now you are Muslim, meaning you're part of Club Islam. Like you have a membership card, but you have to pay the dues. You pray, fast, do this, so you are part of Club Islam. What is the call to? What is the call of the prophets to? To Allah. The Prophet ﷺ is commanded in the Quran to say, "Qul hadhi sabili, ad'u ila Allah." Say, "This is my way." That Islam. I call to Allah, ala basira with insight. Ana wa man ittabani. So when we say that Palestine is an Islamic cause, meaning that it is directly connected to the reality of Tawheed. The reality of Tawheed. And we have to reframe the way we look at what is religion. We are not part of something called Club Islam. And the members of Club Islam are the Muslims. What is Islam? Aslamtu li rabbil alameen. It is to submit and surrender to Allah, the Lord of the worlds. Islam is simply the means of submission. It is not the end in itself. And to be a Muslim is not someone who's part of Club Islam, but a Muslim is one who submits to Allah. Who are you? Your identity is, I am a servant of Allah. What am I doing? I am serving Allah. And that's why the name of one who's serving Allah is that I'm a Muslim. But where is Allah in all of this? How often do you hear about Allah? Or even the prophets who are the callers to Allah in our religious discourse in general. Do a whole bunch of things in our own personal, you know, personal lives. Do a whole bunch of things for Palestine. Why? These are all means. Means are necessary, but they're not the end. وَأَنَّ إِلَىٰ رَبِّكَ الْمُنْتَهَىٰ And truly, to your Lord are all ends. Okay. And that is what pure religion is. لِلَّهِ الدِّينُ الْخَالِصِ For Allah alone is pure religion. So we need to shift our consciousness. And one of the great divine wisdoms in tribulations is to realign our consciousness, to create within the weak, heedless, world, you know, worldliness-inclined human being a sense of desperation, need, and urgency to turn to Allah, to shed our worldliness, but also to, to shed a little bit of our smug, shell religiosity, of just going through the motions, and to truly feel that sense of connection with Allah. Okay. And the matter of Palestine is a matter of, it's a test to return to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And these are blessed lands that we care deeply about because these are lands of Tawheed. These are lands of the prophets. But it's also a reality that this is why they are lands of tribulations and they're a test for us that do we care about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But we also have to see that we must be people of faith. And we talked earlier in the seminar about this reality of Allah swearing by the fig and the olive. We won't repeat what we said there. But... Tribulations like this manifest the critical choice of the human being. That we do we choose to be of the worst of the worst? Or do we embrace the way of faith? <inaudible> of faith and righteous action. But what is faith? Faith is not that ascribing yourself to 
Qab Islam. Faith is that you accept as true what the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has come with. That the primacy of your concern is Allah. Iyaka na'bud. It is you alone we are humbly devoted to. That is what religion is. How are we devoted to God? That is the form of religion. But its reality is that commitment to God. And this is what the Palestinian cause manifests. And that's what we see manifest on our brethren in Paris, Palestine. You see faith and its fruits. What are the fruits of faith? Certitude, reliance upon Allah, steadfastness, gratitude, contentment, clarity about the promise of God, in Allahi haqq, that the promise of Allah is true, knowing that the reckoning is true, the hereafter is true, and then to live accordingly. But we also have to have so the first thing is we, we ourselves must renew our tawheed, right, of living tawheed. Not just a cursory, yes, Islam is to believe in Allah and this and this and this and then, no. Islam is submitting yourself to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Islam is about Allah. It's not about you. It is you we worship. It's not I worship Allah. No, it is Allah that I worship. You put Allah first. But related to that is to have certitude. If you have faith, you have true certitude. Now we have certitude about Palestine and these lands, the lands of Sham that are in, under tribulation, that these are the lands of Allah, of divine oneness, of faith, of truth, of virtue and of good deeds. And anyone who's been to Damascus, for example, and seen its reality, not just the forms, there's all kinds of wacky and wonderful, I saw some of the worst of corruption in Damascus too. Not that I chose to see it, but it's hard to miss. Um, but these are special lands. These are special lands, and we should have clarity about that. And given that they're special lands, they're meant to have tribulations. They always have and they will till the end of days. But these qualities that are manifest in the best of its people are the qualities of that are the keys of victory. Because Allah tells us, in Tansurullaha Yansurkum, if you give victory to Allah, He will give victory to you. Right? To have faith, to have a commitment to truth, to virtue, to good deeds. And we're not responsible for Palestine. The land is the land of, the lands are the lands of Allah. And people are Allah's, are in Allah's care. Our responsibility is what do we do? That is the critical question. Right? And we also know that victory is not, victory like reward is not manifest in this life. Victory, ultimately what is to be victorious? وَمَنْ زُحْزِحَ عَنِ النَّارِ وَأُدْخِلَ الْجَنَّةَ فَقَدْ فَازِ Whoever is saved from the fire and granted admission into paradise has won, has been victorious. وَمَا الْحَيَاةُ الدُّنْيَا إِلَّا مَتَاعُ الْغُرُورِ And this worldly life is but delusionary provision. It's things that you gather but you don't get to keep. It's like if I go with, my, with a friend of mine for lunch, so we line up, we gather a whole bunch of food, and when we get to the counter, we must leave it all behind. That today we accumulated a wonderful meal. That's this worldly life. What do you eat of it? Nothing. Except while lining up, you manage to snack a little bit on the stuff you piled on your plate. But you can't take any of it with you. That's why Imam al-Shafi'i said, إِنَّ لِلَّهِ عِبَادًا فُطَنَا طَلَّقُ الدُّنْيَا وَحَاذَرُ الْفِتَنَا 
Allah, truly Allah has smart servants who divorced worldliness. And worldliness is to allow the concerns of this world to distract you from God. And who are wary of its tests and tribulations. Rather, the, he continues, rather they saw it as a turbulent ocean in which the only shore ship is righteous works. Rather, they saw it as a turbulent ocean whose only shore ship is righteous action. And that's the call of tribulations like this. لَعَلَّهُمْ يَذَّكَّرُونَ That perchance they may take heed and rectify their affair. So this is this is certitude that we should have. We should not think that that, and we should not focus on the emotional. And we'll talk about that in a, just a moment. But that, look at that child who died, look at this. No, we have to look with the eye of faith. There are only two ways of looking at reality that count. Which is to look with the eye of faith and the eye of responsibility. That's like coming out of the shower and looking at the weather. And you open the window, keep staring at the clouds and the snow, and it's freezing, and oh my God, and you'll get colder and colder, and your house will get colder, but you still not put on any clothes. Like if it's cold outside, what do you do? Dress accordingly and go where you gotta go. That's all there is to it. But just staring at the cold weather okay, will make your house freezing cold, and will make you freeze. And you won't get where you need to go. And you have an appointment. And time short. The third duty is to pray. Ya amanu sabri wa sala. O you who believe, seek assistance in steadfastness and prayer. And the steadfastness, the highest of steadfastness is sabrul iman. Is the steadfastness of faith. To realize that everything is from Allah. And then the steadfastness of submission to Allah. That what does God seek from me? If this is what he seeks from me, that is what I do. And charity. Right? The Prophet ﷺ said, never deem anything of the good to be paltry. You say, Gaza needs billions. And they're going to bomb it again. And this and that. You don't know. What can, what can you do? Do it. What can you do? Do it. It's come and you can see the details in our, in the course on the virtues of Jerusalem, that the Prophet ﷺ encouraged the Sahaba to go to Masjid al-Aqsa. One asked, what if we can't go? Then, amongst the things, is to send oil to light the lamps of the of Masjid al-Aqsa. And they say it's not necessarily oil. Okay? It's do what you can. Do what you can. Never deem anything of the good to be paltry. So give. Give intelligently, but give. And pray. And at some point, if enough people care, there'll be, there's a tipping point. That's a guarantee from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. One of the great scholars of Pakistan pointed this out, something that's mentioned by the classical scholars as well. If you consider the hadith of commanding the good and forbidding the wrong, the Prophet ﷺ said, whoever of you sees the wrong, let them change it with their hands. If you cannot, then with their tongue. Then what with the tongue? What do you do with your tongue? Then change it with your tongue. Okay. Whoever of you sees the wrong, let them change it with their hand. If you cannot, i.e. if you cannot change it with your hand, then with your tongue. Then be committed to change it, even if it be only by speaking out against it. You know, saying that that's wrong, don't do it. And if you cannot, then with your heart. And that's the least of faith. Then what do you do with your heart? Then change it with your heart. And of the many lessons in that, is that if enough people seek something with their heart genuinely and what's the heart is the faculty within you that seeks the pleasure of Allah what outcome is pleasing to Allah and you pray to Allah for it that's all you can do if enough people care 
change happens. Change happens. That's a divine promise in, in the Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet. They also refer to that as the, the tipping point. Enough people want something, it happens. Divine supply follows human demand in manifestation. A fourth aspect is you have to have knowledge, right? Rather than following news, learn a little bit. Learn a little bit. Learn about the history of the prophets. The stories of the prophets are not for children. They're for every believer. And there's a reason why, historically, children were taught the stories of the prophets, but you should know those stories and live them. So we should make a commitment to learn the stories of the prophets. And in times like this, most of the stories of the prophets revolve around the land of Palestine. To read the stories of the prophets. We also know the life story of our beloved prophet ﷺ himself. Because it contains lessons for personal and omatic change. Know about the virtues of the lands of Sham, of Quds, of Palestine that have come in the tradition. We point to just to a few small things about it. Know the history of Islam. Know the history of Islam, and particularly these lands as well. If you're concerned, stop just following the news. What's in the news? One party is bombing the other, and the other party getting bombed. There's people dying. You know that's happening. Now, why? Go read. Don't be at the behest of just Ignorant voices just relating things. How many pictures of dead children do you need to stare at? And what do they tell you besides break your heart and break your resolve? Okay. But equip yourself with the knowledge that benefits, with the knowledge that gives you understanding and that results in individual and collective action. Learn your religion. Right? Know your faith. Know the virtues of the qualities that will change your individual condition and that can be a means for you to be an agent of collective change of the condition of our ummah and humanity. Right? Those actions that are pointed out in Surat At-Teen. إِلَّا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ فَلَهُمْ أَجْرٌ غَيْرٌ مَرْضٌ For them alone is reward unceasing. What are those righteous actions? They're personal actions of faith and personal devotion. And there's collective action. And who call one another to truth. And who call one another to being steadfast. Right? So this is a critical component. So cut down a little bit on the news. Read the great news, which is the Quran. And when you read the stories of the prophets, find out a little bit about it. Right. How? Open some books of tafsir. Go to Quran.com now. There's a tafsir connected right there. You can access Ma'arif al-Quran. It's right there on the Quran.com app or the website. Read the stories of some of the prophets. Right. Make a commitment to learn your own religion. Because that's how we change our condition. But also don't neglect what you can do. Rather than sitting around watching the news, engage in local and global advocacy. What has Allah facilitated? Do it. But be principled and prophetic in your actions. Don't, we act. We, we, our identity is we are servants of God and followers of the Messenger. We are not servants of our anger, of emotion, of expediency, of anything like that. Right? And part of this is also collaborate with those who are engaged in principled advocacy. And alhamdulillah in our community, there are many. When we have resources here, for example, Justice for All Canada are doing some very good advocacy work. And they're raising the temperature on you know, Canadian you know, the, on the government and politicians who have taken shameful stances, unconscious, and wherever you are in the world, speak out. Because we know that we change, if we can't change things ourselves with our hands, we change, it's the prophetic command to change it with our tongue. And if you can't, then at least hate it in your heart. 
And, and you, that is also part of change. So, but we can, and there are means in most societies, if you, unless you're somewhere where you're going to get jailed and your children will be akin to orphans, etc. but we're not in most of the world in those situations, that collaborate and assist those who are raising that awareness. But be guided by reason and religion, not by anger and emotion. Do not adopt the ways of others, but rather take this as an opportunity to adopt the prophetic way. Even when we dispute with others. And what is our, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, Ud'u ila sabili rabbika bil hikmati wal mawridati al-hasana. Call to the way of your Lord with admonition, with wisdom, and beautiful admonition. Wal mawridati al-hasana. Wajadilhum, and if you dispute with them, and dispute with them in the best of ways. The best of ways are those most effective, guided by the values of our religion and the ways of our Prophet So that is our, our duty. So what we can do, we must do. And if Allah has given you particular skill sets, direct them to raising awareness to facilitating change in the ways that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has granted. Because that is the call of the fig and the olive, what tini was zaytun, right? And we looked at the meanings of that earlier. So this is what we wanted to cover of why Palestine matters. This is a matter of tawheed, of divine oneness. And this is a test for us as individuals of how are we as servants of Allah. It's a test for us as an ummah, that do, are we committed to Allah? Are we committed to the teachings of the prophets? Because Palestine is the land of the prophets. But also you see manifest in our brethren in Palestine, beautiful examples of faith and certitude. But we must stand by them, support them with our commitment to our faith, with our hearts. What is in our hearts? How do you change it with your heart? By changing the state of your heart. <coughs> but also by having certitude in the promise of Allah. By praying for them. And what that faith entails of give, it, give something of your wealth. Whatever it may be. Small things add up to great things. There's someone who has their birthday today, little girl. One of the gifts she wanted for her birthday was to plant some trees in Palestine, some olive trees. You might not think that's a big deal, but good intentions are transformative. Someone plants 10 trees, and where do trees grow from? From trees. That could be entire orchards. We know the lineage of the trees planted by the Sahaba in Medina, those trees planted by the hands of the Prophet ﷺ himself in Medina. Right? So don't deem anything of the good to be paltry. You sponsor one orphan and take good care of them. And one of the children of that orphan become a person of knowledge. And that person of knowledge revives an entire community. Never deem anything of the good. And all you did was just sponsor an orphan for a meal or two that you partake in. So have this certitude of faith. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us that and may he grant relief and assistance and facilitation and victory to our brethren in Palestine, our brethren in Kashmir and all the lands that are oppressed and grant us to be of those of faith and certitude and resolve and determination and of those who leave the way of folly and, and frivolousness and commit to wake up. Has the time not come for those who believe, for their hearts to be humbled by the reminder of Allah and that they not be like 
those who were granted the book before them, for whom time passed and their hearts become hard, became hard, and most of whom are utterly corrupt. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and do, do, do they not know that Allah gives life to the, dead, to the earth after it's dead? May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant life to those lands with faith and prosperity and all the lands of the Muslims and give life to our hearts by the water of prophetic guidance. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa barak ala Sayyidina wa Nabina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Walhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Before we close, do, do we have any questions? Inshallah ta'ala. Go ahead. Our rallies and protests part of advocacy? One has to see. That, you know, means, there's a principle in Islamic law that means take the ruling of ends. Okay. Means take the ruling of ends. But, so one should have a sense of purpose as a believer. Why am I doing something and to what end? So sometimes it's important for people to be aware that Muslims care. The people, there has to be a, a public demonstration of concern. It moves people because your know, politician want, want votes. Companies want profits. Small p, right? We want the way of the profits. They just want the way of material profits. So that show of concern wakes people up. Right? But we must be principled, right? We must be principled in that. That we should not be taken over by sways of emotion. There's people saying crazy things sometimes in protests. And we don't accept that. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala warns us in the Quran, do not let the transgressions of others cause you not to be balanced. I'dilu. Be justly balanced. taqwa. Be justly balanced, for that is closer to taqwa. We do not belittle other people, mock and deride even our enemies. So it's not a personal matter. It's not a personal matter. This is not, it's not about Jews. It's not about Jewish people. It's not about... Okay. It's about truth and falsehood. It's about right and wrong, justice and injustice. And it's not personal. The people the Prophet ﷺ fought. So many of their leaders entered Islam and the Prophet ﷺ accepted them. Just think that that's the way of our religion. Khalid ibn al-Walid embraced Islam. He is the one who led the counterattack at Uhud, killed some of the dearest companions of the Prophet Abu Sufyan entered Islam. And he was one of the leaders of Quraysh. Hind entered Islam. She's the one who commissioned the, the assassination of the Prophet uncle and who bit his kidney or liver, whatever. Wahshi, the guy who speared the uncle of the Prophet Hamza, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, Asadullah, wa Asadu Rasulih. He entered Islam. The Prophet accepted his Islam. Later, Wahshi killed the false prophet, Musaylam al kadhab He said, I killed one of the best of people and I killed the worst of people. And the Prophet accepted. Now it's very difficult for the Prophet to become friendly with Wahshi because he just killed his uncle, who was almost like an older brother to him, because he's only a few years older than. The Prophet ﷺ. And so on. It's not personal. Because right? we're not a tribe and we don't think tribally. We are servants of God. Okay? So there can be wisdom in them, but we should, you know, if, if we participate in marches, we, we have to be guided by, by reason, by purpose. And alhamdulillah, certainly here in, in Canada, the, the, you know, the marches, the, you know, Many, many Muslim groups have called them and they've instructed people on how to march and you know, not, not to be driven by anger, by, you know, by ego, but rather you know, we march as believers if we choose to march. But it, there's nothing saying thou shalt march. There are many ways to do good and also don't impose one way of doing good on other people. If you don't go to a march, you don't care. No. There's lots of ways of good. Any other questions, inshallah? 
lugar. No, so that there's no doubt that the Muslim, you know, Muslim lands got got weakened, and this this part of the cyclical nature nature of history. That's just a reality. Emperors, empires rise and they fall, and you know, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala explains that in the Quran. One studies history, one sees that reality, and there's anyone who reflects. There are many lessons in why they do so, and the great Muslims got many. Ibn Khaldun is just one of them. Talked about why do societies, even internally, you know, the center and the periphery, the strength get, center gets wealthy, but then, it, and then, but then it gets busied by its luxury, and then the periphery comes in okay, and takes over, because wealth accumulates somewhere, <laughs> the people in the periphery want some too, and that's just the cyclical struggle even within societies. And he and many others talked about that. And, you know, the Ottomans were just like any other empire. They had their good points, they had their bad points, they had their successes, they had their failures. But they had sent, they had sent, uh, they had attempted, you know, they, there was a Sheikh al Islam, quote unquote, for England. You read about Abdullah Quilliam, he had the title of Sheikh al Islam for there. The first book written in Afrikaans in South, South Africa was written by a, an Otto, you know, a scholar sent by the Ottomans to what's now Cape Town, I don't think, in the Western Cape in South Africa. The first book written in Afrikaans was an Islamic text, was written by an Ottoman scholar. Okay. So they, they sent people to all kinds of different lands. But they had, they had their capacity and they had their range of concerns. They sent similar delegations to what is now the United States of America. They had, they had treaties with the United States. You can read about those. Right? So they, but they also had their internal challenges, right? So we were not in any, we, we don't, the point of history is not to glorify it nor to glamorize it, but to learn from it for our own lives and to learn about what we need as communities, as societies, and as an ummah. And that's what uh, you know, some of the scholars said, the history is useless, it's gone. So one of the great scholars of Islam, uh, Imam al-Sakhawi wrote a book called At-Tawbikh ala man dhamma tarikh the stern rebuke of those who would crit criticize the study of history. Because if you just lived in the past and say, oh, the Muslims were amazing in the Andalus, etc., one, that's just a, you know, that's a glorification of it. That's not the point of history. The point of history is not to accumulate facts. Then did you know that this? It's not things just to talk about when you, when you go for, you know, for, for a Faluda late at night, that you pull out facts. But rather, and sorry if you're hungry and thinking of Faluda, um, although if you come all the way to Misaga, you don't hesitate to have some. There's lots of good options. Um, but rather to learn for ourselves and others. And, and that's, what, that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us about the histories of the past peoples, prophets and others in the Quran. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for uprightness and steadfastness. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa barak ala Sayyidina wa Nabina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Wa alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wa salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. لا إله إلا الله محمد رسول الله.